2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. Sorrow or grief is to be emotionally sad and upset about a situation. And some of us, many of us, have had something that we were saddened about. Something happened in our life that we were utterly saddened about. Something that just broke us up. And a lot of times, we, we, when we approach worship, we want to talk about being joyful. And yes, that's good. We want to talk about being rejoicing. And that's all that's, the Bible tells us we're to do those things and be thankful. But I think there are times when we need to be broken up about some things. I think the proper, sometimes the proper mode of worship is to be emotionally and grieving and be sad. Jesus said, blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. And I believe that when Jesus talks about that in Matthew chapter 5 and Sermon on the Mount, blessed are they that mourn, it's really in that that idea that he's talking about those who are mourning over their sin those that mourn over sin they're broken over it it bothers them they're upset about it psalm 51 verse 17 the sacrifices of god are a broken spirit a broken and contrite heart O god you will not despise isaiah 57 verse 15 for thus says the one who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in a high and holy place, and also with him who is of a contrite and lowly spirit, to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. Again, while I say, while it's important to worship with praise and thanks in a celebrated mode and atmosphere, there's also times we need to be worshiping God with tears and grief. Sorrow that might last for a night, but that joy that will come in the morning. And so we're going to look at that this morning about a godly grief, that the virtue of godly sorrow. Let's pray. Father, I praise you for your word. Thank you for revealing truth to us. I pray, Father, that you will help us to understand the place of godly grief in our lives. And Lord, I pray that some of us who are grieving now, we may be grieving over something that's taken place in our life with a godly, with a godly sorrow. Lord, I pray you help us to, with this, help us to place our hope in you. Help us, Lord, to, it to be productive and not to waste the sorrow. And may, let it be productive, Father, this morning. Pray, Lord, you give me your words to share. And I pray, Father, help me to be filled with your spirit that might share the things I ought to share. Thank you for your blessings. Thank you, Father, for speaking with us this morning. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Paul shares this with the second the Corinthians. This is not the first letter he shares with the Corinthians. This is his second one, probably his second one, <laughs> second Corinthians, right? So godly sorrow, godly grief is produced by a loving rebuke. Because in the first letter that Paul gives to them, he is bothered by this church. He is grieving over this church because this church had some gross sins within it. There was one sin that really bothered him. And if, you ever want, if you're on your own sometime, you can look that up. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, he talks about a sexual immorality that was going on in that church in one of their members. He says that there was a man who had his father's wife. They were in a sexual relationship. Now, now whether this was his mother or whether it was his stepmother, it doesn't, doesn't matter. It was, it's still sick. It's still, and, and Paul was just upset with the gross immorality. He said the pagans didn't even tolerate this behavior. It was worse than the pagans. And so they had this going on in their church, and instead of being upset by it and grieved by it, they were actually arrogant about it. They were boastful and prideful about it. And I'm thinking about, what does that look like? I think what, what it looked like was the church, instead of being upset over the sin, they were gossiping about it. 
did you hear what's going on over there? See what they're doing? Instead of being upset about it, they were gossiping about it, okay? And when we hear something going on, that's going on in a church member's life or another Christian's life, the thing we do is not to gossip about it. The first thing we need to be doing is we need to be grieving about it. It needs to upset us. And the Apostle Paul was upset. And he tells him, you need to be upset about this. You need to be grieved about it. And so what did Paul do? He told him, well, I want you to do this. I want you to do this. You need to kick this member out of your church. Throw them out. Get rid of them. And they did, eventually did that. And then the second letter is basically he's telling him, okay, you did that, now restore your brother. Okay, we don't want to kick people out just to, just to do it. We want to be redemptive about that, okay? Now, there are other issues of this church that they had. They were divided. They had their cliques in that church. Their church cliques. They had the people who said, we're of Paul, and there was other people who were of Apollos, and we're, uh, uh, we're the Jesus people. And, and so these cliques in that church, and they were all proud against each other. They also had lawsuits. They were suing each other in lawsuits. And idolatry. They also worshipped idols. There was abuse of the Lord's Supper. They would all be divided when they had the Lord's Supper. They wouldn't even wait for everybody else to get there. They would have the Lord's Supper, and they would leave other people behind. And he said, don't you have houses to eat, eat in? You can eat in your houses. But when you get together in your pla- the gathering place, you need to be together. Wait for each other. And then women, they had women who had short hair, and well, they shaved their heads, the, the prostitute. They, they were having these issues going on. They abused spiritual gifts. So my spiritual gift is better than your spiritual gift. And they were using this to show off. And then they had some that said the resurrection is not going to happen. This is a pretty messed up church, wasn't it? And Paul was, you know, he planted this church. And I'm sure he was sitting there and he was just wringing his hands over this church. But the one thing that upset him the most was when he heard about this sexual immorality going on and the attitude that your church had regarding that. That they didn't grieve, but rather they boasted about it. Sorrow or grief is important. Sometimes a church can be off and yet still be a a legitimate church. Sometimes it happens. A church can be that far off, and this church was. It didn't disqualify them, though, from being a Christian church. Now, there are some things that disqualify us from being a Christian church. If we deny who Jesus is, if we deny God himself, the, there's a God, and that Jesus is the Son of God, that would disqualify us from being a Christian church. But I want you to notice this morning, sometimes rebuke is necessary to bring ungodly grief. There needs to be someone to share something that is uncomfortable and it's not fun. I remember years ago, we had a church in, in Williamsville, a little church, and there was a couple there. They were, they, the guy told me he's going to divorce his wife. And just like that, God told me he wants me to divorce my wife. And that's what he said. I said, God didn't tell you that. Well, I didn't say that. <laughs> it upset me because, number one, God didn't tell you that because the Bible says that God hates divorce. God hates it. Malachi. And so I got up the next Sunday and, and I preached on why God hates divorce. And God is not in God's plan. I preached that. And I said, anybody would say that God tells them to get divorced is lying. I said that. And what happened? The guy repented. And they, he, he passed away a few years ago. And he was married to her when they passed away. And when he saw that truth, he was grieved, and he got it right. Sometimes, sometimes a person needs to be corrected. I need to be corrected. I had my, I've had my beatings. God has used other people to rebuke me. Because I can be wrong, and I can be off kilter. It is possible. And this is what Paul says. And unfortunately, why us preachers have to do this? We don't like doing these. We sometimes have to preach truth, and it's not comfortable sometimes. It's kind of like taking a cold shower in the morning, right? So there's another term, eating the frog. You know, it's the first thing you do, do the hardest thing, and, hardest thing, and then everything else is easy. 
Uh, there are some uncomfortable things we have to face. And Paul, this was very, very uncomfortable. He wrote this, and he was, he was grieved because it was grieving them. He says, I don't want to grieve you. You know how it is when you're a parent? Remember when you were a kid, your mom and dad says, it's going to hurt me more than it does you. And they spank you and you said, no, it did hurt you more than it did me. And, and you're kind of wishing it would have killed you because they would have really regretted it, you know. But you know what? When you become a parent and you spank your child, it truly does hurt you worse than it does that child. When you spank the child and that child is crying and weeping, thinking you hate them because of that. And immediately you want to embrace the child and say, I didn't do this because I hate you. I do this because I love you. And Paul is preaching that to the church at Corinthians. He's saying, I'm doing this, I'm sharing this because I don't despise you. I love you. I'm willing to do anything, endure anything for you. But this is not good for you. This sin is not good for you. So, Sometimes it needs to happen. It needs repu reproof, rebuke, correction needs to take place in order for God to bring a sense of conviction about the sin from His Word. 2 Timothy 3.16 tells us, and it talks about the Word of God is breathed out by God and is profitable for rebuke, right? Reproof, correction, and training in righteousness that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped into every good work. It is important for us to receive at times correction from God's Word. It's not fun. It's not fun. And it brings grief. Years ago, they'd have these revivals. And Billy Sunday and his revivalists, they would do this. The very first thing they would do, the first half of the revival they would talk about, they would do two months long. It would be two months long. And Billy Sunday would be preaching to the church. The first part of the revival, he'd be preaching to the church, be preaching to the church. Preach, 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 preach to the church. And there would be a break. All of a sudden, something happened with somebody who confess, said, I have sinned. I have sinned. I need to get away from this. And then all of a sudden you have this barrage of people confessing their sins and getting right with God because they're grieved. And what would happen after that was all these lost people come to faith in Christ because the church got right with God. Because the church grieved over their sin and got right with God, then God all of a sudden could do His work amongst the lost people because they could see Jesus in them. And now God is working. So that's what Billy Sunday said. The first half of this, God would work, and when we have that break, and then all of a sudden God's Spirit starts flowing through His people, and all these other people come to faith in Christ. So sometimes we have to deal with sin in our own life. I say sometimes. I say all the time. Amen? I mess up all the time. I mess up every day. And I need to spend time in His Word. I need to allow God to correct me from where I'm wrong. So it's important for us to hear a word from God so that we can have the kind of grief that Paul's talking about. So I want you to see, notice secondly, that this is different from the sorrow of the world. He tells us, worldly grief produces death. Godly grief produces repentance that leads to salvation without regret. There is a worldly sorrow. There's a worldly sorrow that, that, that's upset when, with sin. It's the sorrow of Cain. Remember Cain when he sinned? Uh, Cain, he was the one that killed his brother. Remember that? He killed Abel, his brother. And what did, what did, what did Cain, what was he sorrowful about? Was he sorrowful that he missed his brother? Was he sorrowful that his brother actually died and he killed his brother? Was he, did it make him sad? No. He was sad because of the punishment that God gave him. He said, God, my punishment is beyond more than I can bear. The, see, the, the worldly sorrow is sorrowful about the consequence of the sin, not the sin itself. So this is the, the sorrow of Cain. Remember the sorrow of Pharaoh? We've been learning about Pharaoh, Pharaoh and our kids, right? Pharaoh, here he goes. He, he says, uh, Moses tells the Pharaoh, he says, Pharaoh, let my people, God wants you, let his people go, let them go. There was Okay, I won't let him go. And then what happens is God sends some plague upon Pharaoh in Egypt. And Pharaoh says, all right, Moses, all right, I can't stand this lice. I can't stand these boils. I don't like this. Okay, you can go. And then as soon as and Moses prays, he says, God, okay, release that because he's going to let him go. As soon as God lifts the, the plague off of Pharaoh, 
You remember what Pharaoh did? Nope, not going to let him go. <laughs> it's, like, it's like as soon as the hardship is gone, they return back to the rebellion and sin. So a worldly sorrow is sorrowful because of the trouble that sin produces. But if there was no trouble, they would continue in the sin. The godly sorrow is not because of the consequence of the sin, but because of the sin itself. We hate the sin because we hate the sin. That's the difference. I want to repent, I, I want to repent as long as it's good for me, but the godly sorrow says, I want to repent because I hate this. I don't like it. You have the sorrow of Cain's sorrow of Pharaoh. You remember the sorrow of Judas? Judas? Judas betrayed Jesus. Not, yeah, he betrayed him. And Judas is it's interesting. It was after he betrayed him, was he started feeling his remorse. I betrayed the innocent blood. And what Judas had, he's had he had a sorrow without hope. See, the godly, uh, worldly sorrow has no hope. His despair and his sin led him to despair of God. So what happened was Judas, he saw that he was sin. He felt guilty, felt bad about it. And he hung himself because he knew that he was bad. There was no hope in it. So worldly sorrow is sorry and afraid of the consequence and fails to repent because it has no hope. It has no hope. The kind that tries better and focuses on behavior on the outside, but the heart is not in it. Before I go on to really focus on godly sorrow, I want to ask you, what kind of sorrow have you experienced? Why? Why are you following Christ? Are you following Christ because you're wanting to avoid the consequences of not following Christ? What's the desire? What's the drive for your repentance? What's the drive I think sometimes, I, I think we do need to preach about hell. We need to preach about repenting from our sins so we don't go to hell. But I think it needs to go a little deeper than just that. I don't think we need to be preaching a get out of hell free card. I think we need to be sharing how God hates sin, how God despises sin to the point that we despise it as well and that we want to get rid of it. Godly sorrow. It's the sorrow according to God. It is not the consequence of sin merely, but the sin itself that is grieved. It is not, I have incurred the wrath of an angry God, but I have displeased and grieved my Father, my Savior. It is to know that you have broken the heart of God. Have you ever experienced that? Now, I know, I know, I know none of you have ever sinned. <laughs> but I'll tell you about myself. I have sinned grossly in my life. And after I have sinned, after I've done that, I could feel in my heart God crying that I broke his heart. And I remember, I remember at that moment, I said, God, just please kill me. Anything but to feel your pain when I've done this. It, it's an un unbearable feeling, unbearable sense that I have hurt God. I have actually broke His heart. That is unbearable. There have been times I've actually prayed for God. I actually have prayed, God, kill me. Just kill me. God says, no, I love you. I, I won't do that. That's godly sorrow. Godly sorrow. It cuts us to the heart. We're not, it's not just the penalty, but the fault itself is a thing against God. When we get to that point in our life, when we see that my behavior affects God, it, 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 it punishes God. When I, when I see that, that causes godly sorrow. And it makes me want to repent away from it. I get away from it, not because of the trouble that sin might cause me, I went away from it because I don't want to break God's heart because of how God feels about it. And because God hates it, I hate it too. Godly sorrow is the sorrow not of the, just the consequences. It's the sorrow of the sin itself. Not merely the penalty, but the fault itself. And when you see it as God sees it, you won't, you won't, want, you won't want to go back to it. You want to stay away from it. 
Now, godly sorrow has its hope in God. While Judas' despair in his sin led him to despair of God, Peter's despair in himself and his sin did not lead him to despair in God because, his, because God is faithful. Remember, Peter, he denied Jesus in the worst, part, in the worst moment in, in all of history. He denied knowing Jesus three times. Remember that? And it says when the cock crowed, when Peter heard that, he remembered what Jesus told him at the the Last Supper. And it says he went away, wept bitterly. But Peter didn't kill himself like Judas did. He had a hope because Jesus told him beforehand, he says, I have prayed for you, Peter. Now, I remember, no, I don't remember. (laughs) I think about this. Why did Peter weep bitterly? Was he worried about going to hell? He denied Jesus. And he realized he had just failed Jesus. That's what broke his heart. Like imagine he's looking Jesus in the eye. Jesus knows I have just denied him to think about breaking the heart of his master. Brought such pain to Peter's heart. It overwhelmed him. And he wept bitterly. Have you ever wept bitterly like that for over your own sin? Because if you have, I'm telling you, you've experienced, you've experienced godly sorrow. And Paul says it's a good thing, not a bad thing. Godly sorrow. This is a good, but it, there's hope. Because in godly sorrow, there's the, there is the possibility of repentance. There's a possibility that I can repent from this. It causes you to hate and despise the sin. And when the Holy Spirit brings that sin to mind and you're broken over it, we can repent. We can turn from it. It's an intense grief. And that's what he says. Godly sorrow produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, without remorse. So once we repented of it, it's in the past. We know that God has forgiven it, and it's settled. There's no remorse. It's done. But the the worldly sorrow, there's no remedy for it. There's no repentance. Because they don't believe in Christ. They don't trust in Christ. So they're kind of constantly, they're feel, they feel ashamed and they're upset because they're going to re- reap the consequence and they're trying harder, they're trying harder, they're trying harder, and they never get over it. They still feel the shame and guilt. And it's a constant death. And they're trying to prove it to everybody. I'm okay. God's okay with me. We're okay. When they inside, they know they're not okay. When all they need to do is just simply repent of their sin I'm not going to go there anymore and then come to God. And God will forgive them. God will accept them. The fruits of repentance are brought in here. I want you to notice the fruits of repentance. He shares with it. Verse 11. This is what Paul was wanting to see. Now, what Paul was afraid of when he heard about their sin and when he wrote the letter, he was afraid that when the pers- people got this letter and he started talking about the sin, he was afraid what the people would do is, what does Paul know? He was afraid that they would reject what he was saying. They, he was afraid that they would harden their heart against what God was trying to do in their life. And so they would reject it. They would refuse it. They would refuse to repent. They would not humble themselves and repent. But instead, what Paul sat, found out, he found out they did humble themselves and they repented. And look what he says. He just rejoice in verse 11. For see what earnestness this godly grief has produced in you. Godly grief produces an earnestness, an earnest care versus indifference. Hmm, I don't care. Somebody says, well, this is wrong. This is sin. This is against God. Hmm, I don't care. It doesn't bother me. But this church, it bothered them. Now, remember Jonah, (laughs) prophet Jonah, the reluctant prophet. Jonah goes into Nineveh. God says, said to Jonah, I'm going to tell you, I want you to go to Nineveh because in 40 days, I'm going to kill them all. I'm going to destroy them all. Jonah wanted that. He liked that idea. <laughs> so he goes and he runs away because he doesn't want them to be, they don't want to be saved. Okay, so Jonah runs. And finally, Jonah, of course, you know the story about him and the fish and all that stuff. He finally goes into Nineveh for three days. And he doesn't give him any word about repentance at all. He doesn't share any hope at all. Because Jonah doesn't want them to repent. He doesn't want them to. He goes in there against his will, saying to the people of Nineveh, he says, in 40 days, God's going to destroy the city. 
because of your sin. He goes for three days. And when the people hear about it, they're cut to the heart. They're upset about the sin, about the wickedness. Now, the Ninevites are worse than the Nazis. I mean, the things that they've done are horrible. They're cut to the heart, and they repent. And the, the, the leader of the city, he declares a fast, a sackcloth and ashes. They, they earnestly, they're not indifferent. They didn't say, this is some kook off the street. This is some weirdo out there named Jonah. We're not going to listen to him. No, they hear him. They take him serious. And they repent, and they're earnest about it. And God sees it. What did God do? He changed his mind. He said, I'm not going to send it because God, God is not willing to any perish. They all come to repentance. See what godly grief caused earnestness into the, the Ninevites? And earnest care. So when God deals with us about our sin, we, it create, when, when that sorrow is produced in us, it produces an earnest care instead of an indifference. If we are indifferent about our sin, then we need a little bit of godly sorrow. We need to taste a little bit of godly sorrow in order to get there. I'll tell you, there's times when I am indifferent to my own sin. And we need, I need to be sorrowful. I need to see my, what my sin has caused to God. My, the second sees that the clearing of yourselves. See what earnestness this godly grief will produce in you? But what eagerness to clear yourselves to show, basically clear yourself. I'm showing my disapproval of this evil. That's how we, they were clearing themselves. Look at what he said. Indignation. There's indignation. It's anger against the sin. Not, not against people, against the sin. Instead, so what fear is reverence, carefulness, what the fear is. What longing. Longing, the desire to make it right. That longing. What zeal, the zeal for God. And then he says, what punishment, or we should say discipline. Readiness to discipline, to get rid of it, to do something about it. So it's not just, it doesn't stop, it doesn't stop with just feeling emotional. We don't stop there. We allow, we, we allow it to produce action that shows we have changed We've went and a change of mind. It leads to a salvation without regret. Once you notice, he says, if I can see this right, my eyes are doing funny tricks on me. Yeah, so, so at every point, you have proved yourselves innocent in the matter. You proved yourself cleared of this, forgiven, let go of. These things that hold them back is let go. They're being set free of these things that would hold them back. So I ask you this morning a question. Would you be free from your guilt, from your remorse or your shame? Do you have things in your life that bring you sorrow because you have it and you wish you didn't have it give you the good news you can repent you can turn to god you can turn to christ who has provided his sacrifice as payment for those sins you can repent of those things and god will accept it and will wipe you completely clean as though you've never done it as those never happened now that's yeah, I know that's the invitation to salvation for a person who doesn't know Christ. But for those of us who are Christians, John, he talks about 1 John. He talks about the blood of his son cleanses us. He says, uh, it says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And the blood of his son, Jesus, cleanses us. So it's, that's a present that's a present tense. That's, that's something that's continually active. As we're walking with God... We see our sinfulness. The closer I am with God, the more I see my sinfulness. And the more I say, God, clean, cleanse me. And then every time that happens, God cleanses me. So let me ask you, would you be free from your guilt, your remorse and shame? God offers that to you freely. 
if we just turn to Him. Turn to Him this morning. God does not show you your sin to just bring you, to, to bring you down under the guilt and shame. And I shared this with the uh, was it, teenagers last week. The difference between God's conviction and the devil's accusation is that when God gives you conviction of your sin, when He shows you what your sin you need, you need to repent of, you know specifically what it is, okay? And you know you can do something about it. When the devil, when he starts to accuse you, you just feel guilty and you don't know what for. You feel shame, you don't know what for. What is it? And I have actually prayed that to God at times. I said, God, what is it? I feel guilty for something. What is it? And if I don't hear anything, if I don't get anything specific back, even within that day, it's the devil. And you know what? The devil can go straight to hell, right? That's where he's going with all his lies and his false accusations. That's what it is. And see, when God gives you, when God shows you something that you need to repent of, it's very specific, and there's the hope that you can get, you can get past it. But when the devil shows you, and he's accusing you of something, it's meant to keep you in shame and guilt, keep you burdened down, to make you feel bad and horrible, and you can't do nothing, and that God doesn't love you, he doesn't want you to pray, he doesn't want you to read the word, he doesn't want you to come to church because you're just too bad, and that's what the devil does. He's, he's trying to keep you down. He's accusing you. You can't serve God. You can't do anything for Him. And you know what? You don't know what it is, but you just feel bad. That's the devil, and he brings shame. He's trying to. He's trying to lie to you. And God doesn't listen to the devil. He listens to Jesus, who is your advocate in heaven. He's praying for you day and night, even though the devil's asking for you. He doesn't listen. He's not. He's not going to pay attention to his accusations. And why should we? Why should we listen to it? So this morning, if you are experiencing a grief, a godly grief, a sorrow, just something you're burdened about, and there's something specific, something specific, let it have its work. Don't waste it. Let it have its work to bring you to forward, to repent and to turn to Him. But if you are experiencing a sorrow, you're worried about, you're fearful about the consequence, or you're ashamed, and you don't know what it's about, there's nothing specific about it, and if the devil's accusing you, like I said, resist him and he will flee. Let, just resist him. I don't know where you are this morning. I don't know what God's dealing with you. But God hates, I, I was reading that this morning, how God hates sin. And he will lead us to hate it too. And he will, lead, he will cause us to live for Christ the way Jesus lived. Jesus hated sin. And he lived that way. He will cause us to live that way. So whatever that is this morning, as, and we'll, have, we'll just have prayer and then we'll see what uh, God wants you to do. Let's pray.